Hello and welcome to episode 9 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I'm your host. Today's episode is Carmen Bradford, who is not just associated with jazz royalty, she is jazz royalty. Uh, her grandfather played with Dizzy Gillespie, her father played with Ornette Coleman, her mother played with Louis Armstrong, and then at the age of 22, Carmen herself was picked up by the legendary Count Basie and his orchestra uh, while she was here in Austin uh, attending Houston Tillotson University. Um, if that's not a crazy impressive family resume, I don't know what is. Uh, Carmen, over the course of her career, has certainly carved out her place in the history of jazz, collaborating with and sharing the stage with with uh, jazz greats such as Wynton Marsalis, Shelley Berg, John Clayton, Ray Brown, Nancy Wilson, Christian McBride, Lena Horne, Doc Severinsen, Tony Bennett, James Brown, Willie Nelson, Tierney Sutton, Frank Sinatra, Kurt Elling, Freddie Cole, Benny Carter, Lou Rawls, Seth MacFarlane, Count Basie, The Basie Band, The WDR Big Band, the list just keeps going on. I could go on for days and it wouldn't end. Um, so it was such an honor to be able to sit down and have an extended chat with Carmen. I mean, the time really flew by. We had such a blast and before we knew it, an hour and a half, an hour and 45 had passed. So it's a long one, but I promise all of her stories are so rich and it's getting this fly on the wall, amazing opportunity to hear about the inner workings of knowing these people who we revere and we have all their recordings, but we don't have as much of uh, you know the recorded stories. So it was, uh, it was certainly something that I treasured a whole great deal and I hope you will as well. Uh, we talk about her time joining the Basie Band and having a very uh, kindred, uh, almost like uh, father-daughter relationship with Count Basie. Uh, we talk about her many run-ins with uh, Ella Fitzgerald in the perfume department at Neiman Marcus, and then uh, you know being together with her at Carnegie Hall uh, when they were performing with the Basie Band, uh, and having dinner with Frank Sinatra. I mean, the stories keep going on and on and on. So I won't talk too much. Let's just get right into it. Um, a few things that I did want to plug, as always, we're plugging out albums that I think are really great and just people in the scene that we should definitely uh, support. So the first one that I want to do is a guy who was a huge mentor to me uh, coming up here in Austin. He really saw something in me and tried to, you know, uh, teach me all of the lessons that I needed to learn the easy way so I wouldn't have to fall flat on my face and learn the hard way. So here is uh, David Young. His record is uh, the 2001 record, Appassionata, uh, which has one of my favorite tunes of his of all time. It's an original that he wrote wrote when he was 18, I believe. It's called When I Knew Emily. Uh, go check that record out. It's on Spotify, Apple Music, all the different places. I think you may even still have a few physical copies that you could order, um, but definitely support David. He's here. He's still the most velvet swinging dude here in town. Uh, we love him so much, and uh, I look forward to uh, the next time that I get to see him and embrace him and hug his neck. Uh, so definitely go check out that record and check out all the stuff that he has going. Uh, the next person that I want to uh, plug is someone who's going to be a future guest, uh, Benny Banak III. Benny is taking New York by storm and really is taking the whole world by storm. He just got off of a tour with uh, Postmodern Jukebox uh, over in Europe, all throughout, was traveling everywhere. Uh, and he's just the consummate entertainer He's a singer, he is uh, an entertainer, he's an amazing trumpet player, and that's his primary instrument, but you wouldn't be able to really tell what his primary is, because both, well, everything he does is killing. It's just swinging so hard, it sounds so great. Uh, so the record that we're plugging right now is his that came out in January of 2020. It's called A Lot of Living to Do, and it has uh, Takeshi Obiaki on piano, it has Christian McBride on uh, bass, and it also has... Uh, um, Ulysses Owens Jr. on drums and also acting uh, double duty as the album's producer. Um, Veronica Swift, who is going to put us all out of business, an incredible jazz vocalist who you should check out her stuff as well. Uh, she's got a one record out and another one that's coming up, is a guest on the record, as well as Alita Moses on Where's the Love. 
really just through and through an amazing record. Uh, so go check that out right now. And uh, you can go over to his website that I'll put the link right here down below so you can check more of that out. So um, until we have him on the podcast, we'll definitely just uh, enjoy the music and uh, keep watching what he's doing. He's still playing a ton. He's got a lot of stuff going on uh, even throughout the pandemic and doing it all safely and just killing the game. So anyways, let's jump right into today's episode. Here is episode nine, Carmen Bradford. This is Off the Bandstand. so good. I, I have to tell you that I, I've looked so much forward to this for the past several weeks, especially just in the interviews that I've seen you do, that you are just the biggest ray of sunshine. Like you were always happy. You're always smiling. <laughs> and it's just like, I was just like, this is going to be, you know, if nothing else, if I'm having a bad week, this is just going to tie it all together. So I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. You had performed at, the first time that I had seen you was uh, back in October of 2019 at the University of Northern Colorado. You were up in Greeley uh, and did something with oh, their... Uh, the, choir, the choir. I did a master class and a concert with the big band. Yeah, so I, I saw you at the concert with the big band because um, my collaborator and pianist is a guy named David Mescatique, and um, he was here in Austin. We would uh, we're playing, you know, most of the nights of the week. And then he went up to pursue his doctorate at UNC. So okay. he was a piano player in the band, the big band that you did the performance. Oh, okay. Okay. And it just so happened to be this like perfect, you know, uh, uh, set of events that happened. Cause I had gone up there to a visit him. Cause it'd been like three months and, um, B, uh, my, uh, musical hero and the person who I study relentlessly is Kurt Elling and he was playing at um, I think the Soil Dove Underground and I was just debating whether or not to go up that weekend he was like well Carmen Bradford's going to be here on Monday doing a concert and I was like that's it like buy the ticket immediately like buy the plane ticket <laughs> so um, but what, what I was, what, yeah well, what I was going to say was that um, uh, you know people don't get a chance to know us that much uh, off the bandstand, with the exception of people who are just masters at um, connecting with their audience, which I was going to say you are, I felt like we got to know so much about you in between tunes. It wasn't just kind of like, and here's a tune that was written by, you know, Johnny Hartman or like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Harold Arlen, and then here's the tune, which of course, that is absolutely imperative. People should know the composers and the lyricists of different tunes. But at the same time, I love so much whenever we get to have a connection with the artists themselves and you did that marvelously. So I've just talked a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, dial Yeah, you can save, save all that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you? How are you holding up? Where, where are you at these days? And, and is that different than when you, where you normally are? Have we started? We have, yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. No, no, uh, you're good. At, now, what was your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. So um, where are you at uh, these days, like during, during COVID? And like, how are you holding up uh, wherever you're at in the, in the nation or in the world? Oh, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I'm holding up pretty good. All of my concert dates um, were either canceled or rescheduled. And that started on March 1st. So I've been at home since March 1st, um, going only to the supermarket and back. And uh, I'm, I'm getting a little stir crazy, you know. <laughs> but I know, we, I know we have a long way to go, but man, this is... It, 
you know, there are days um, when it's kind of easy and then there are other days where it's like, oh my goodness, where can I go where I won't roast? Because, you know, the humidity here in Georgia is no joke. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever you're going to, <laughs> whatever you're going to complain about or pine over, you need to take a walk early in the morning, you know, and get over it and come back inside. Sure, absolutely. You know? But, um, I, you know, I'm hanging in there. I, I teach at San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Mm -hmm. Uh, jazz voice and um, so I'm preparing for that and I've met some students you know over the summer that that needed advice so they're calling me and wanting to do private lessons which is always fun and mm -hmm. you know rebooking gigs for 2022 <laughs> wow yeah a lot of, and 23 because a lot of things are just not going to happen in True. 21 you yeah. know so uh, yeah, and catching up on my cooking. I cook every day for my oh, husband, cool. which he appreciates very much. And uh, yeah, just trying to get my ducks in order, you know, like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. So on, on the dates that you had on the calendar, uh, what group were you performing with most? Were you doing guest stuff with universities or were you, I know you have a trio and you do work with them. What were the majority of the dates that you had on the calendar? Well, I don't do a lot of trio dates. I do a lot of symphony dates, hmm. um, which I just had some to cancel right before we, we came online, a few more. Sure. Um, but I, I have a tribute to Ella Fitzgerald show. Hmm. And uh, I, there's a Lewis and Ella show that I do with Byron Stripling, trumpeter okay. and uh, singer, entertainer, who is wonderful. And then we have another show called uh, Cotton Club, and that includes uh, myself and Byron and uh, a tap dancer. Okay. Oh, By Byron is really the star of that of that show, but we support him in a big way. It's a wonderful show, hands to to see it. But yeah, those are those concert dates. Some of them were a week long, and oh, the wow. entire season is canceled. You know, for a lot of symphonies, uh, if not all of them. Yeah. you know, across the United States. And I'm sure it's happening in Europe as well, you know, and yeah. Asia too, you know. Well, but yeah, a lot of big band, um, a lot of Basie, Count mm -hmm. Basie orchestra dates. Yeah. Um, that we were, so, what I was supposed to be in uh, Europe now, but July was a Japanese tour that was canceled and a portion of mm -hmm. a, a, a European tour also. So it's, you know, it's big. It's a big mm -hmm. hit. Yeah. And, and it, it's so unfortunate too, because on that side of the world, some things are a little more under control, but the U S you know, not at all to get political. I mean, if somebody wants that, they can go to my personal Facebook page and uh, you know, I'm not adverse to it, but I never uh, uh, force political uh, uh, topics on that. But yeah, some people are, are getting back to, you know, at least like on a smaller scale of entertainment, like cinemas, right? Cinemas are opening up in like UK and right. such. And, and so it, it's kind of unfortunate that that might start a little sooner over there, but with us being in kind of the thick of it still. Right. They don't want us and they don't want us to come yeah. Yeah. that. So I'm glad you said it because that's what Ooh. I what say? <laughs> well, there's nothing political about that. This is, this has yeah. been, you know, the fact that, you know, we had a full European tour schedule for for um, all of July, and uh, I had another one here in August. You know, with a with another um, an Austrian big band I was supposed to tour with, and uh, it just it, it is what it is, you know. Yeah. So even if we were getting a little healthy, they still don't want us. Sure. Yeah, um, and of certain we certainly don't want to bring them anything either, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and to do a fourteen-day quarantine is just out of the question. Even if they said okay, even if the president and and whatever countries you were going to, Germany and and France and Italy and uh, just you know, sure, it's still like I, you know, you need fourteen days. Yeah, I would yeah. imagine. I mean, I would. I if would. I, would, if I was I would, the yeah. the agent, you know. Yeah, I was going to say I'd even do like 21 days just to just to be sure. But but even then, I mean, I have a, uh, a friend. Do you know the the um, chamber group uh, Chanticleer? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. OK, so so um, in my early I went to Texas State and in my first year, I got to be 
really good friends with somebody who was a guest professor for a semester while um, another professor was on sabbatical. His name is Matthew Altman, and he was the creative director um, and director of uh, uh, Chanticleer for a long time. And I just saw that he's over, I think, I think in Japan right now, and, and he was posting like daily vlogs of him 14 days in his tiny little hotel room and just mm -hmm. saying, going absolutely insane. So it's kind of one of those, if you can brave it and tough it out, but then again, if they don't want us and they don't allow us to come, then it's a whole nother thing entirely. But uh, yeah, what a world, what a time that we are living in. Yeah, <laughs> really, really something. You know, it's funny and I'm embarrassed. Oh gosh, I know two guys in Chanticleer. Hmm. Um, my vocal student, um, Amelie Henman is married to Brian Henman, who is in the group. Oh wow! And I, I think, I think uh, the gentleman that you mentioned, I think, studied a little voice with me. But I'm, oh really? I, I'm, I might be mistaken. He's he's very tall. He's very slender. He's blonde. Uh, oh, he's a, a counter. No. Um, no. Not him. I can't yeah. actually think a man's name, so I'm hoping he doesn't watch that. But he was wonderful. Sure, sure, of course. <laughs> well, there's there's so much that that I want to talk to you about. I mean, just over over the course of the week that I, I was prepping for for our talk was, um, and you know, usually I don't I don't like to over prep because I never want anything to feel inorganic in the way that we're talking. But you just come from such a extensive history of of jazz royalty like like not to just like shower the compliments on even though you would be totally deserving i mean there's just so much where it's like not only have you certainly carved out like your place in history as like an incredible jazz vocalist who has pushed the industry forward and been so versatile but your parents and and you know i'll i'll, I'll pull up just a, a couple of my notes that i hear but um First of all, congratulations, uh, belated even though, uh, but the, the 2019 Grammy, uh, uh, All About That Basie, that record is amazing. And I was yeah, so happy to see you. this. Yeah, you, you were on there with, with uh, my hero, Kurt. And I was like, this is, this is the best possible. And then the group that introduced me to jazz, Take Six, was all, okay. well, I mean, it's just, it's just stacked. I mean, to be in that company is, is, Unbelievable. I can't imagine the, it, what was that like recording that record or the, the tune that you did on that record? It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I originally was supposed to sing something else, um, but um, we ended up doing Honeysuckle Rose, which I think was very appropriate as a tribute to Ella since they were paying tribute to Frank and, sure. and uh, Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And, you know, many others, but uh, I was really honored to have that opportunity to pay tribute to her because I just adored her. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I'm always careful with these that I don't want to ask people the same questions that they've always been asked. And they feel like, oh, here we go. Now I just, you know. I don't mind. And, but but I, I, you sent me that clip of all those times that you had met Ella Fitzgerald in the first few times all just I don't want to give it away it's your story far be it for me to take your spotlight just no, no. tell a little bit about those times that you met Ella well I met her when I was uh I think about nine I think it was my mom and I were shopping in Beverly Hills California in the perfume department at Neiman's on a Sunday they used to have sales on Sunday back then yeah. <laughs> uh in 1969 and uh there was Ella Fitzgerald in there shopping for perfume, you know? And then I saw her again um, a couple of years after that in the same perfume department. <laughs> you know, then again, I think when I was 19, and sure. then I saw her again after I got the job as a vocalist with the Count Basie Orchestra, with yeah. Mr. Basie, I should say. Yeah. In in Austin, Texas. Thank you very oh, much. Oh wow. Oh wow. Yeah, we we haven't even mentioned that yet. Like I said, there's so much to talk about. Um, but uh yeah, and and so one thing that I loved so much is I was I was listening last night to um uh 
your interview with uh, Dr. Thunder's podcast, uh, the, the quarantine series or quarantine sessions. Mm-hmm. And uh, hearing you talk about, you know, if memory serves me correctly, I mean, it was 12 hours ago, it should, but um, uh, that you were saying that she, you, you came in and, and she was uh, uh, prepping for the show with, with Basie and she just said, you know, I, I hope they like me. I, right. We were at Carnegie Hall and I had done my little portion already on the first half of the show. So I, yeah, you know, her door uh, uh, cracked a little bit and I knocked on her door. You know what? I haven't shared on, on any interviews this set. I really wanted to go in there to see what she thought of my performance. Oh, you know, she- I really wanted to see what did you think? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's Ella Fitzgerald, and it's and you've exactly. already been you've already been welcome into the fold. I mean, you were like handpicked by Count Basie. So in that way, I mean, it's not like it's not like you know, it's just some person going up to you know this this legend, this titan of the industry, and saying, "Hey, what did I think? What do you think?" It, it she's you are there. You're in the family. With, with well, you know, you never want to be a pest when somebody's going, getting ready to go on stage. Sure, sure. She was already dressed to go on, and it was intermission then, and so that's when I went and I said, "Hi, Miss Ella," and she was pacing the floor, and I said, "Are you okay? Can I get you anything?" And that's when she said, "Well, I just hope they like me." Yeah. And that's when I said, "Well, who are you talking about?" She said, "The audience." I said, "Well." Who doesn't love you? Yeah. And that's when she said, well, baby, I don't, I don't do well all the time. I said, well, when was that? <laughs> you know? She said, yeah. I don't do well all the time. You know, I just, I said, well, I've never heard anybody say that you just weren't incredible. And so um, then she went, um, went out on stage and, and, tore all the plaster off of the walls at Carnegie Hall. Naturally. Just shut it down. I mean, she was just incredible, man. Yeah. And just as humble, just so, I don't know. I can't even describe it to you. And it's interesting because I have found, I I find that I, I do that as well. You know, uh, people, a lot of singers and instrumentalists, I'll say this, you know, sometimes we don't say, but some audiences look like they're a little more intimidating than others. Your The music that you're covering that particular night might be a bit challenging and it'll, it'll uh, keep you with your hat in your hand for sure, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it, I think it's no matter the accolades that that people rack up whether it's whether it's local whether it's in your small town whether it's on a global scale uh, like right. even Ella and uh, I mean you you start to have that feeling of imposter syndrome because mm-hmm. you just so so uh, intensely feel this admiration for the people that you're around but right. then it's one of those things where you always think like oh well you know, I'll get to the point where they're at at some point in my career. It may be whenever I'm 50, but they were 20. But then you get there what other people deem as like, oh, you're there on that same level, but you still feel like you're just, I think that's um, a, a rare, humble quality in a singer, which we're always glad when we hear it from singers, because sometimes singers can be a little more, you know, um, uh have a little bit more flair with with their their maybe pride we'll we'll call it that we'll keep it we'll keep it not incriminating but I, but I, I think that's what you see in the people who um are are some of the greatest is is that humble quality because they realize that the music and and you know to people who aren't jazz musicians you know or 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 take it as seriously necessarily i'm i'm not sure that it may sound more heady or verbose or, or just me trying to be like, Oh, you know, like talking about a vibe, but this music is so much larger than any one of us. And we owe so much to every single generation. I mean, you talk about classical music. That was my degree in college was in, in, in more of like opera studies and with an ed certification. But uh, you talk about jazz. I mean, classical music, you know, progressed over, you know, hundreds of years, jazz has had 
a little over a hundred years to evolve a dozen times, you know, so. Yeah, it's still, it's still classical music though. It's our classical music. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you see people who were classical musicians who, who were really kind of paving the way for that in, in creating the jazz idiom. And then, you know, it was born in the heart of, you know, in the heart of New Orleans, you know, where, where people music. Yeah. So, Louis Armstrong, Buddy Walder. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one person who I also wanted to ask about your interactions with, who we deem is like the jazz patriarch, you know, a, a family patriarch is Ellis Marsalis. And I saw on your website that you had, had, had done some things with Ellis. And, um, you know, I think the entire world was, was mourning that because it, it felt like a huge milestone of somebody who had passed. Not that we were sad, but we were celebrating his life. But I mean, he did so much for bringing our music to the forefront and, and, and evolving it. So uh, what was your interaction with Ellis like? And what capacity did you know him and work with him? Well, uh, I'm also on the Count Basie Christmas album. Mm. Uh, that they did with Johnny Mathis, Ellis Marcellus, and um, Lettucey is on that one as well. Um, I had met uh, Mr. Marcellus years prior to that, mm -hmm. just on different festivals, and uh, and I was I was I've been friends with Branford and Winton since I was oh I'm going to say at least 24. We've known each other, but. Uh, to do that recording and have him playing behind me on Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas was just wonderful. Yeah. He's such a sweet, patient, uh, brilliant accompanist, you mm. know, and musician, of course. But uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think uh, if I recall correctly, I was listening to a, a, a interview podcast with uh, Branford uh, promoting Upward Spiral. Um, uh, you'll notice there's probably a lot of uh, Kurt connections. I'll I'll try not to say his name too many more times, but uh, but he was on that Upward Spiral press tour, and uh, he had said something about you know uh, he had gotten chewed out or something like that at a young age for like playing over a singer on a gig, and he came home and his dad was like, "Look, you want to play with singers? You got to realize that it's like you know for better or worse, you kind of have to be." not subservient but you have, you kind of have to serve that singer you can't just be playing a bunch of stuff on top because there needs to be this kind of trade-off you know amicable trade-off of like all right here now i'm in front now you're in front you know all these different things well you have to tell a story exactly and the instrumentalist response should be the re the response to me telling my story it should be the well honey this is what happened when she left her husband and then the response should be really yeah and then what happened? Right. And then the singer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's be that's beautiful. It's, 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 it's illuminating the idea of it being a dialogue. Absolutely. And they both need to know the lyrics to the song. This yeah. is very important. Yeah. If you don't know what you're playing, it's just a, you know, a bunch of notes that you might not uh, be approaching as well as you could had you known the lyrics. Yeah. Had you known the ooh baby baby of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one, one of the things I wanted to ask about, you know, to, to bring back to something we were talking about earlier is, so you were born in Austin, and then you were raised in Altadena. So uh, when did That's you- Altadena, California. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When did you move from Austin? And then when did you return? Well, when my dad graduated from Houston Tillotson and University of Texas at Austin, we left right after he graduated. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure what year that was. I'm going to guess 1963. Okay. Maybe two, because we moved to California and then we lived with family. Okay. Until my dad got his first teaching job at an elementary school. Mm. And uh, yeah, but yeah. And then we moved to Altadena and my parents bought a home there and I grew up in Altadena, California. Yeah. So, so when did you, uh, when did you come back? Cause you came back, right? Did, to 
go to uh, Tillotson. Houston right? Tillotson. Yeah, yeah, I went to Houston Tillotson University. Um, that's an interesting story too. I had not planned to go to college. Hmm. Um, I had planned to get a job sending background for Stevie Wonder. Ooh. And um, I did the audition and I didn't get the job. And, and maybe two or three, I used to really love to go to the beach every day too, hmm. to Santa Monica Beach. And my dad bought me a car for my senior year of high school. So cool. on one of those days after the audition, I pulled in my dad's driveway because I was living with him and my mother was living in Los Angeles at that time. She was singing background for um, Smokey Robinson, but she's a jazz vocalist. Yeah. Her name is Melba Joy. So I went in my dad's house and my mom and dad were sitting in the living room. I said, hey, what's going on? And they said, well, have a seat, Carm. So I, I should have known that it was going to be some serious stuff, right? So I said, okay. So I sat down and, and they said, well, you didn't get the job with Stevie Wonder, so what is the plan now? And I said, well, I'm going to try something else. You know, surely I can get a job singing background for somebody else. My dad said, well, you don't have a job. You don't have any money. I'm paying your car insurance and you need to go to school. Sure. We think that that would be best for you. And this was like maybe three or four o'clock in the afternoon. So I said, well, I don't, I don't want to go to school though. You know, and so they said, well, we've decided that you're going. Mm -hmm. and you're going to go tonight. Whoa. They said, we have called the president um, of Houston Tillotson where I went to school. This is my dad talking, where I went to school. And he said that we can send you tonight and that you can start on Monday. What, what part of the year was this? <laughs> this, was, this was days, uh, two days before registration. So it was August. <laughs> wow. And so I said, I'm not going to Texas. And they said, oh, yeah, you're going tonight. Your mom's going to take you to the mall now, and you're going to get yourself some spring and fall, I mean, some fall and spring clothes and sure. a couple of winter pieces. And I'm going to the hardware store and getting you a big trunk. And we'll just put your little television in there. I said, what about my car? And he said, well, it'll be here when you get back. Freshmen can't have a, a car anyway. So sure. I said, I'm not going. They said, no, no, we already have a ticket for you. You're going to school tonight. They said, and sing well, because you need to get a scholarship. Yeah. So I went, my mom took me to the mall. They packed my ass up, okay? <laughs> and put me to the airport, put me on the plane, and I told them I would never forgive them. They said, it's okay. Yeah. We'll figure out whether you're going to come home for Thanksgiving or not later. We'll see, mm -hmm. you know. He said, and take care of business. Don't go down there singing in any clubs, you uh, know, don't go down there drinking, you know, because the legal age for drinking was 18. Sure. In yeah. 1978 in, 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 in Texas, in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. So immediately my wheels started turning. I said, oh, sing in a club, you know? Yeah. I would say that I lived a very kind of sheltered life. I didn't do anything wild when I was growing up, you know? I was a cheerleader, I was a Girl Scout, I was in the Brownies, I had Barbies, I mean, the whole yeah. girly, you know, I was in the choir, I did madrigals, I did chamber singers, and, you know, just your basic California girl farting around. Sure, sure. You know? <laughs> but but, but, but in, in a very cultured way, I mean, singing well, all sorts of kind of music and madrigals, and, and so, I mean, that's... That's more than a lot of people can say. You know, usually it's just like the the Latin piece of music that the choir director picked out for people. You know, rather than kind of going down the rabbit hole. So you had you had, even though you say it was sheltered, it sounds like it was still very very rich of uh, musically. Oh yeah, I was really yeah. exposed to everything. My mother and my father made sure that I went to to hear the LA Philharmonic, you know, on Saturdays they had a program with Zubin Mehta conducting. And okay. So yeah, I was exposed to everything. And I was in an R&B band in high school and really enjoyed that. And um, what was I gonna say? So yeah, I, I, I loved all kinds of music and I did musical theater in high school. I did Hello Dolly and 
was Dolly Levi. And so, you know, I did all of that. Yeah. So. Well, you know, and, and, and with that too, you know, I, I have entire uh, uh, sections here about Melba Joyce, your mother and Bobby Bradford, your father. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, so with Melba, uh, was she like on the road or I should say Miss Joyce, I should be respectful. <laughs> Miss Joyce, I uh, got to pay, pay my respect. Uh, uh, was she on the road a lot? Because I know you said she did USO tours and stuff like that in Vietnam. She was performing with all of these big names and the ink spots. And you're saying Smokey Robinson. I didn't know that one. And so uh, tell my me. My grandfather, that was my grandfather that oh, my oh, right. played with the ink spots, but that's okay. Right. But yeah, she wasn't on tour all the time, Christian, but because. I think my mom felt very torn. I have two older brothers and they're twins. And I think she found it difficult to leave us. Mm -hmm. But I will honestly say, and you should interview her for yourself so you, she can hear her, her story too. But for me to watch her stay home with us, she just seemed to be very sad. And at every opportunity I saw her singing on stage somewhere, or she was gonna go on tour, you know, for a couple of weeks or a month or two months, you know. She was just at her happiest and loves to sing, even now, you know. So uh, it was interesting and it was very enlightening for me. I knew from watching, growing up with my parents that I didn't wanna have any kids. Yeah. You know, I knew what my baby was gonna be this business, you know, yeah. and I was going to dive in completely. But yeah, she, um, you know, she, it, she did the best she could as far as balancing that, you know, but she was certainly happier, I will say, when she was singing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and with your father, too, I mean, I can't imagine having my father playing with Ornette Coleman or anyone <laughs> of that renown. I mean, what was yeah. that like? Were you able to interact much with, with uh, uh, Mr. Coleman? Like, was that something that you were like, did you know him well or was it kind of separated the, the stage? Well, life stage family? well, here's the thing. Ornette, um, Cedar Walton, David Fathead Newman, mm. um, uh, and, four other people whose names I can't remember, James Clay um, and several other musicians. My dad's a trumpet player, right. plays flugelhorn uh, also, um, and coronet. Um, you know, I was, that was in 19, maybe 60, I think I may have been 63. Okay. 62 or 63, I was born in 1960. Okay. So my dad was writing arrangements, you know, for Ornette. Uh, and his group, and this is before Don Cherry, just mm -hmm. so folks know. Sure. My dad was the, in the original band, and um, so, you know, I saw, I remember meeting him once I was with the Basie band, but of course he saw me, you know, when I was a, a little bitty girl, so, but other than that, no, I don't really uh, recall any of those early, early years. Sure. But, um, but my dad, um, it was interesting because he's played avant-garde music all his life, uh, all the life that I can remember. Yeah. And uh, he's written some incredible music, but you know, both my parents were parents when they were home, you know? Yeah. They didn't yeah. ever push me or my brothers. One of my brothers is a, an incredible singer. Hmm. And uh, the other one is a really, really good singer too, but he doesn't let us hear him he just lets us hear him in little tiny sure. notes here and there, yeah. but a really, really talented. He, he's a bass player as well. But um, yeah, when, when they were home, they were mom and dad. And, you know, on the weekends, both of them either had gigs or one had a gig, but they were always playing, always writing, always creating. Yeah. Wow. That That's like I said at the very beginning, I mean, just like how much not only you are associated with the the history of jazz is what we all look back on, but like and currently look at, but also just your parents and 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 your grandfather as well, right? I, I misspoke, but yeah, you were saying that like he played with the Ink Spots and played with with Dizzy too, correct? 
And he recorded with this. Um, I can't think of the name of the album, but one of the tunes that was a a, a hit for him was called "Love Me Pretty Baby." Okay. He he was uh, the singer for Lucky Millinder's big band um, in the '40s. Of course, he was with this, and uh, he toured with. Um, oh, Carmen! Come on. <laughs> toured with uh, Ernie Fields. Oh wow! Who who had a big band, and my grandfather sang with him. I think he may have sang with Ernie Fields' band first. He ran away from home, from Oklahoma City, okay. uh, his senior year of high school to New York, and he did the Apollo Theater. Mm. Okay, did yeah. the Apollo Theater during that competition, you know, that talent show, and won singing Tura Lura Lura. Beautiful, beautiful falsetto, beautiful high tenor voice, and yeah. uh, was incredible till the day he died. He sang every day, and his chops were just killing. Yeah. Really, really a great singer. So that's where me and my mom got our voice from. And my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, sang as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I think she was really young when she sang, but my grandfather was on the road as long as I can remember. Wow. It's it, amazing. It, it's all so incredible. So another thing that I had a question about was I know like I've heard you say that that uh, you really didn't let the the singing thing or like and I'm, I may misspeak here so feel free to correct me at any point but you really hadn't like let your parents know much about the singing and wanting to really uh, go after that until 16. Right. But for your father who's this like incredibly accomplished trumpet player and your mother who's this incredibly accomplished uh singer th that seems like a pretty pretty big secret to to keep you know uh like jokingly speaking but was that something that you had kind of kept to yourself or was it was it at that age that that it really clicked and you were like oh no this is this is what i want to want to do oh no i knew i wanted to do this when i was about four uh-huh you know, or maybe five uh, when I uh, just, and also you have to remember, Christian, my mother was getting dressed on the weekends to do these gigs and she had on beaded gowns and oh yeah, really fabulous hair and eyelashes out to here. And <laughs> it was really, um, and she sang constantly, just really fun to watch. And that's where I, I learned all of my early Great American Songbook repertoire because she played everything. Yeah. When we did our chores on Saturday mornings, it was Brazilian music. Mm. Um, it was Tony Bennett, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, Carmen McRae. And so though I started doing my chores to them at about nine, uh, when I turned on the radio, I was listening to R&B. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, listening to the station called KFJ. I think that's what it was in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So... Um, and I was just obsessed with Gladys Knight and Aretha Franklin and, and Diana Ross and the Supremes and the Temptations. And my heart was just, and it still is, you know, R&B is, is very, very real for me. And I, you know, people look at me strangely when I say that it's kind of my first love. Sure. Still. <laughs> but I adore jazz, you know? Yeah. Um, and my father was teaching at the university level for many, many years um, when I was 16. And, and I just happened to go in his office, um, his home office, and I was looking through his albums and put on this album of Billie Holiday. And though I had heard her before, it's like my ears did a shift. Mm. It's like my ear was ready to receive some serious music my ear was ready to receive another kind of singer, you know, um, just a very seasoned voice my ear changed to. And uh, that's the easiest way I can describe it. And then I was, I was done. Then I started listening to all of the albums in his library yeah. of all the women, you know, that I mentioned. And it was, I was done and I was in, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
And, and I know very specifically, and I think most jazz musicians, especially gig jazz musicians, have had that moment, and some yes. less than others, but some very early, where it's just something, something changes, you know? Yeah. Um, Your uh, taste. Yeah. Your taste. <laughs> yeah. And, and, then, and then another thing, too, is that, you know, there's, there's the moment when it, when it clicks, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, this is, th this is it. And there's also the earlier moment of when it's like, oh, I have no idea what that is, but I know that I love it and I don't understand it at all, but this is it, man, you know? And, and that for me was when I was like 11 or 12 and, and in my town of Lake Jackson, Texas, which is 60 miles south of Houston. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and it, you know, we have this really nice uh, uh, performance hall. I mean, really nice and, uh, uh, it uh they brought a bunch of people to town and to grace the stage because the acoustics are just amazing and the very first group that i had seen there in a official performance capacity was take six. Oh and, wow and, and i i mean they had come out and i was and you know the my choir teacher and, and very close family friend you know i did musical theater in a in a it, you know, to call it a community theater feels like a disservice to Bradsport community uh, or Bradsport center stages because it really was, I mean, just next level. But anyways, neither here nor there, he had taken me and a handful of other students that he thought might enjoy the show. And, mm -hmm. and they open their mouth and they sing the, I think the first tune they sing, sang was gold mine. Um, you know, and, and I was like, I don't, know what this is but there is a feeling that i need to get up and run up and down the aisles <laughs> and they sang a uh, uh, family of love from feels good and i just mm -hmm. melted and i was like i don't know how to come or to to um uh, 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 kind of uh, analyze these complex emotions that that i'm feeling because it's just it it just hits on a level that is so integral to just it feels like humanity in sound yeah you know? man i know what you mean i you know, do it's like mean. it's like the entire human experience and human connection just encapsulated in a in a 90 minute performance but yeah. anyways one, one of the things that i wanted to wanted to uh say specifically of of that i hear in your voice and i i heard it immediately whenever I was going through, kind of pouring through whatever I could find on, on YouTube before I had messaged you and asked you about uh, the albums, um, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, there was, there's one where I was like, okay, yeah, I hear, I hear this, this timbre that I very clearly can associate, but I was like, I don't want to just, you know, assume this immediately. So let me, let me go through more of your discography and see if I can hear it. And I, I can just hear so much of the stylistic use of juxtaposition between straight tone and vibrato that just so clearly embodies Stevie Wonder. That just, I mean, the the passion and the emotion and, and a lot of the stylistic just like influences, it doesn't feel like a Stevie Wonder, you know, uh, trying to imitate Stevie Wonder singer. It sounds like Carmen Bradford has found her sound and I can hear who she loves. And she's totally taken the nuances that she loves and she's put it into something that is uniquely hers. And so whenever I found out, you know, like you had said that you auditioned to be his background singer, I was like, that makes total sense. And like listening to you talk about like other things about Stevie, I was like, it just feels so good. And there's one of the tunes on, um, I believe it's on With Respect is, is the 95 album, right? That's the, I think so, yeah. yeah. So um, I think it was, um, oh, well, I should have written it down. It, it may have been maybe now. Oh, yeah. That feels very much inspired by, uh, there, there were a few tunes on there, but I was just like, the, these feel like Stevie tunes, you know, like this just, this feels so good. So on those tunes, I had looked up to try to find like the credits and such, but, um, you know, I, I'd seen it, what was it, John Chiodini and, and uh, Al, or was it uh, uh, Arthur Hamilton had written some of the tunes on, on that record. Did you have those tunes written specifically for you for the record? No, um, my friends just uh, know people that are really great writers. Sure. You know, 
and said, give her this, see if she yeah. likes this, uh -huh. you know? But that straight tone, are you talking about that straight tone with then vibrato at the end, or are you talking about some runs and reps? Uh, oh, I'm, t I'm talking about like straight tone, like just, just like pulling that taffy, and then at the end, putting a little bit of vibrato on. Oh, well, that's, that's actually Tony Bennett. Oh, really? That's where, that's where you, you got that, that thing from? Absolutely, from that. Wow, okay. From from uh, those two Bill Evans and Tony Bennett albums. That's, yeah. that's, but I listened to those, so that's when I was nine. I started working on that at nine. Mm. And, that, and that Cinemas album of Tony's, uh, are you familiar with that? Where it's uh, these movie, yes. movie theme songs? Yes. It's, I think yes. it's called movie theme song. That album is just absolutely wonderful. But yeah, that's where I, I, I learned that. And I think doing that straight tone, I think I refined it um, when I was in the Basie band listening to the trumpet player and manager at the time, his name was Sonny Kahn. Mm -hmm. He would hold a long tone, um, which seems forever. And then he'd have this really strong vibrato behind it. Mm -hmm. And I used to tease him and go, play nanny, that's like a <laughs> Like a nanny goat. Sure. <laughs> that was just a joke. He's killing. Yeah, but yeah. Um, all of those, all those early Basie recordings uh, that I'm on, um, like Young and Foolish, that's Sonny mm -hmm. Cone playing on that 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 uh, that solo at the beginning of it. Yeah. Da -da -da -da, that. Uh, I just listened to that last night. Yeah. I oh, just, you did. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's Sonny Cone that, that's playing that. But um, um, a lot of times, also. Uh, I use that straight tone. I have asthma. Mm. And sometimes it, it takes even now so much for me to breathe. I have to do a straight tone to get it rolling. Sure, sure. And then and then add that vibrato. But now I just do it because I love it, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that that's crazy for me to hear that you have asthma because nobody would ever know it because it's, it just your voice is so i mean you're, you're so versatile that you can you can do something that's very nice and, and and smaller and intimate and i would love to hear those things with with the trio stuff that you do but whenever you say that you're like yeah i do a bunch of big band and obviously with basie and then and then with symphonies i'm like oh yeah because your voice is a powerhouse and it is meant for the symphony dynamic you know because there's just so much power and passion i mean i had I had messaged you that uh, late last night where I was just, you know, listening and I was sitting here and, 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 and pouring through, you know, just enjoying it, not for any kind of preparation for anything that we were doing, just because in the time that since we've talked, I've really tried to go back and, 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 and pour through a lot of things and try to, you know, not, not in any kind of, you know, scientific way analyze, but just pick up on all your nuances and really kind of get to know you more from a musical perspective. And, uh, and it's just so good. There's, there's one song that I listen to probably once every two days. And I wanted to talk to you about it was, uh, cause I just, I'm, I'm enamored by it is, um, a song that I, I believe your, your mother wrote Melba Joyce was, uh, was I in love alone? Oh yeah! Oh my God, Carmen! Isn't it a you, great tune? You break my heart into a million <laughs> pieces every single time, and Thank I just you. oh my God! I mean, just and and the writing, I mean, it, it speaks for itself. It just so she is an incredible writer, isn't she? Her lyrics yeah. are just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I just, I mean, it just, ooh, it, the, the emotions, listening to that, that song, and, and your- I need to tell her what you've said today. <laughs> oh, yeah, please do, please do. I and love I, it. I would love so much to talk to her as well. I mean, that would be, be fantastic. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, tell me, tell me about that, that tune and, and, and where that came from. I mean, if it's, if it's something that's profoundly personal and you don't want to go into that side of it, you don't have to, I mean, just thinking back to the lyrics, but um, you know, what was that decision like to choose that tune for your record and uh, and carry that on? And how was that emotionally to, to be able to do that? 
Well, I think my mom was dating someone. That's what that's what that was about. And she can tell you more when you when you speak with her. Sure. But uh, she was dating someone at the time. And that's what all those lyrics are about. And the other tune, Be the One, also. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that one? Did you I, hear Be I, I haven't, because I tried to, whenever you said your records were on Amazon, I tried to go and find it to, because I was hoping there would be like a digital thing, but I think there was like a, like an audio CD and then uh, that I was going to uh, order, but it said it was like out of stock. So I, I couldn't find those online. I was just trying to uh, go through whatever kind of Google searches would, would get me as many tracks as possible. But uh, uh, I'll send them to you. Please, please. Yeah, she's got another one that, that is really, really, really lovely that I think you're going to like since you liked uh, was I in love alone? But yeah, she's just a great writer. And I chose, I recorded both of those tunes because they were just beautiful. Hmm. And um, continuity wise, um, I had a, a couple of complaints from uh, my producer. Okay. Um, I think for Be The One, mostly, Donald Brown. He said, well, you know, it's not really a jazz standard and it's not really, a, but you know, I'm, I'm 60 now mm. and I have decided I'm going to sing what the hell I want to sing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so done with, um, well, you know, for years I've been dealing with, um, with club owners on my, on my solo albums that have a problem with the fact that I have R&B stuff on there, but there's enough jazz and there's enough blues on there. You know, there's, uh, um, I, I won't mention who the club owner is, but he sure. said, you just, you have too much of a mix on there. I'm looking, we need, we only hire straight ahead jazz yeah. singers. And you know, just all those rules and stuff. I'm done, yeah. honey. I'm gonna sing what I wanna sing. Man, and, and that's such like, uh you know, not at all to sound like a, a very young person. Like I'm, I'm 24. I, I have, I have so much to learn. Don't let the minimal hair on my face fool you. I'm, I'm, I'm very young, and I have so many dues to pay. But in my time, you know, I, I had a thing where I started performing professionally at the age of 17, and then uh, uh, started performing big band in Austin almost immediately coming in. I just got hooked up with the right people. And then That's they- That's great. Up, yeah, it was, it was really nice. I mean, it was a big band in town that, you know, one of the previous subs was offered the gig, but he had his own Americana band going up. But then he and I were both from Lake Jackson. So he put me in touch with them and, and they really groomed me and then ended up giving me the band and, and having me take over the band. And so that then formed wow. a lot of the songs that I was doing, it, yeah, it was, a, well, I mean, it's nothing like at the age of 22, you know, being picked up <laughs> with, with, with Cal Macy, but I guess it's something. But, um, you know, one of the things that I realized really quickly was being, so, being by far the youngest person on the stage, mm -hmm. so, well, I need to have my shit together if people are gonna respect me as a band leader. And yeah. so then I started to, you know, I, I had a thing where I, I was going to learn, I was going to sit down at the piano and I was going to learn three jazz standards a week, like completely memorize, get them going and build a catalog of hundreds of jazz standards. And so that's what I've done, you know, pretty consistently for the past several years. But, and even though like we, we absolutely have to pour over the great American songbook and, and like the great jazz bass player, uh, uh, Clark Summers up in Chicago, has told me several times is like you have to pay tribute and you have to and 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 be aware of everything that came before and also be focused on the future that's where those new innovative reharmonizations and and new arrangements where you you dismantle it and then you bring it back together but it doesn't have to just stop at the standards because in a way in their most traditional form and far be it from me to shoot myself in the foot professionally but you know I'm just echoing what other jazz greats have said some of those tunes are a little played out in their most basic form like you have to like keep those arrangements alive of the the great ones like Ellington arrangements like Basie arrangements like all of the you know Dizzy arrangements 
but you have to push it forward because that's what everybody else was doing. I mean, you know, it's, it shouldn't just be a period piece. It should be like, yes, that's part of the fold. And now we're continuing to bring it forward. Exactly. And you look at Miles, Miles Davis's career. I mean, he, yeah. he changed so many times. Do we look any less at the great quintet album, cooking, working, steam and relax? And no, we don't look any different at those, but yeah he evolved. And so for you to say that of like, I'm going to sing what I want to sing. Absolutely. And who, who can tell you any different Carmen Bradford that, that. Well, you know, you'd be surprised. There are still a lot of singers that are older than me that are alive that have actually said in my presence to other band leaders. Now see here, Carmen is, she's not even singing jazz. That wasn't jazz that she was singing. That's right, while I was standing there. And I thought, well, I thought, well, first of all, whoa, you yeah. know, she said, you should hire me. I sing straight ahead. And I thought to myself, wow, first, and then my response was, but I'm in the cha same church. I'm just in a different pew. Yes. Here. Yes. Um, one tune. I'm in the same church. Yes. Yes. It's so, all the same church. I just put a little on it. Exactly. exactly. Am I allowed to put a little, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you look at all these like great musicians who have been borrowing tunes that were not originally standards. Thank you. Or, or not originally jazz tunes. And then they have like put it in a big band format. How is that any different? Of course. Any different, you know? Well, you know, I, people are, are just very interesting. And of course, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Sure. You know, but um, I feel like I've, I've had enough years uh, under my belt to know what, I'm, what I want to stretch out on and what I want to yeah. put my little thing on there. You know, some Stevie Wonder-isms on there. Yeah. That's an example. Yeah. But... You know, after a minute, you just got to be yourself. And this is, this is who I am. I've been exposed to a lot. And this is what comes out of great exposure. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. You know, one thing that I'm also curious about that you've touched on in, in previous interviews was that, you know, uh, I, I, I die laughing every time, even if I'm sitting by myself, whenever you tell the story of when Sonny Cohn was like, well, get all your charts. And you were like, I don't have any charts. And then he's like, well, uh, you know, get all your beaded gowns. You're like, I don't have beaded gowns. He says, well, put a rope around your suitcase and just meet us in Boston. You know, like that, that's hilarious. But so, so you had said in the previous interviews that you only knew maybe like you know, a handful, I don't want to say a specific number and be wrong, but a handful of standards to- Two all the way through. Two stand, yeah, what was it, a foggy day and- uh, Lost in the stars. Yeah, right, because those were the two that you, which also, and, and I sometimes go on tangents because I get excited, but how okay. incredible that, that you know, uh, what was it, Passengers was the, was the band that you, or Passenger that- Great. You, and great and, bands yeah you were sitting in you know no with, no, or, no well i was their guest artist sure sure yes yes let me just let me just back up and say that yeah. that mike mike mordecai uh-huh the, the trombone booking agent you know when 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 i was in school at houston tillotson and, uh, and singing in the group minor miracle with john mills and andy murphy and Hank Hemsoth, you know, just all of those cats. Um, I didn't realize that that Mike was uh, a booking agent. Oh, really? Well, I knew that he went in, in uh, you know, I'd see him going in this office and stuff, you know, if I happened to be in that area. <laughs> sure. But I didn't know he was booking us. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. I saw him perform more than I saw him you know, I knew he had an office, you know, and I just wasn't paying attention. Just yeah. young and everything else was just so wonderful. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. I just wasn't paying attention. So anyway, when that, when he booked the Basie Band to come and perform, what's that theater on Congress? Uh, Paramount. Or, we, was, or was it the state? It, was it, no, no, it was, the, it was, I'm pretty sure it was the Paramount. Yeah. So... 
um, the Count Basie Orchestra's manager, um, well, actually it was Will Ale the Will Alexander Agency out of New York. Mm -hmm. And the, the one that did the negotiations, her name is Dee Askew, and she's the manager of the Count Basie Orchestra now. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, she was Willard's secretary back then, but she was also just starting to book some, some acts, you know? Well, everybody was with Willard Alexander from Frank Sinatra to all the, all the big bands, you know, he, he handled everybody. But anyway, um, they told Mike, Dee told Mike Mordecai, no, we don't, we don't need a singer on the show. Yeah. We already have a singer. We don't want a singer opening the show. And um, they went back and forth, apparently, for for quite a while. And thank God, Mike convinced them. Yeah. And Dee gave in, you know. Wow. And let, and let me do the show because they weren't going to, they didn't want me on the, on the bill, you know, yeah. which happens still today, even to this day. Hmm. I, I get the boot. No, we don't want Carmen. We like her, but yeah, she's good. But, you know. And then after they let me on, you know, hopefully I have a really good night and have a good performance. And <laughs> make, them, make them love me. But, um, sure, sure. So Mr. Basie was already uh, riding on a motorized cart. His yeah. health had deteriorated a bit and he was sitting on the other side of the stage before the show. Mm -hmm. And so with the gentleman that traveled with him and I was on the other side just kind of waiting around and wanted to meet him. And I said, I'm going up to meet him. I'm doing it. I'm going over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over and I, auditioned, I, I introduced myself. I said, hi, Mr. Basie. My name is Carmen Bradford, and uh, I'm opening the show for you tonight. And I think you'd make millions of dollars if you'd hire me. Uh. And he said, really, millions? <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. I said, you know, there's nothing like having a young lady in a lovely dress, sure. you know, to open your show. and." He was just looking like he wanted to call security. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I said, well, will you listen to me when I go out and sing? Um, and so he said, yeah, I'll listen to you, honey. So I went out and I did my two tunes, A Foggy Day and Lost in the Stars. And I came back off and I said, well, what did you think? And he said, I'm going to hire you. And I said, really? Because I can go to the dorm tonight. I can go yeah. get my stuff now. We yeah. can leave tonight. And he says, "No, no." <laughs> which, which I've I've heard I've I've heard you say before, but it it adds another layer now knowing about the thing where like you didn't want to go to college and it was kind of like thrust upon you. So that and adds a whole other layer of comedy where you're like, "I'll go to the I'm I'm gone," you know. Right. But had I not gone to Houston Tillotson, I never would have met any of these incredible people in Texas that blessed my life in such a huge way. John Mills, uh, Ed Gwynn, who was a wonderful uh, studio uh, commercial jingle um, gentleman, uh, and Andy Murphy, and, and um, I worked at this, jab, this club called Phases where I got my start. Mm. You know, I sat in at a lot of places, but my, my Got my start at, at Phases. And, where was uh, where was Phases at? Uh, phases was at the end of Chacon, where it meets. What is that street? Was it on the east side? Oh yeah. Okay. It, it was down the street from Houston Tillotson. Oh, okay, very cool. Yeah, I'm gonna say a mile and a half, maybe two miles at the most. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it was such a great place. You know, it had the, this is when the disco era was really booming too. So mm -hmm. you'd walk in and you'd pay, you know, your, your whatever the, the fee was. And to the right, a little further was this huge disco, beautiful yeah. hardwood floors with lights, just all of that. Then there was a great bar and I had my first margarita there ever. Yeah. <laughs> her cigarette, you know, and then you walk down this long hallway and there was a restaurant in between uh, okay. to, your, to your right. And through these doors, uh, they had jazz, a jazz spot, oh, a little man. club. It was just awesome, man. Yeah, the place. Oh my gosh, it was so wonderful. And was, it, was, uh, was that where, where Bebop was living at the time? Well, I don't know about Bebop, but there was a guy that was that was working there that played organ. He played piano and just had all these 
these these synthesizers and instruments that I mean just all kind of percussion yeah. um, and just I just fell in love with that and then I went and asked Mr. Mr. Oh God, what is his name? Mr. Dixon, mm. Lauren Dixon. That's mm. who gave me my break. Um, I went and asked him if I could have a, a Wednesday night. I told him I was a new singer in town and yeah. that I had just auditioned for Stevie Wonder, but I decided to go to school instead. Oh my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, he gave me a Wednesday night. I sang at happy hour. It was just wonderful. And, but, and that's yeah. like that's a perfect pitch too to a to a venue owner because you know I mean all of us know that I I do in, in outside of COVID I do an immense amount of uh, uh, booking and I mean just calling every single venue and my whole thing is like I call the venues who have never even thought about music you know because that's right. the best place to get in you know yeah absolutely. So, and and I mean obviously you try to do the clubs too you do the restaurants you do the steakhouses you know and um uh but it, it's kind of one of those things where like a wednesday night happy hour you you can just walk up to him and be like what's the worst that could happen give me a wednesday night happy hour you know <laughs> let me prove myself and then maybe later down the road give me a give me a friday night headliner you know uh, yeah man it, it was so, those were the best years of my life mm, that's you know and that's saying something because you have had some amazing years of 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 you know like going going to and, and like I said, you know, I try never to be totally like on script of notes because I love it just to be so organic. And, and but mm -hmm. there's other things that I, I, I also want to talk about is just so, uh, you know, on, on I wrote down just like a handful of your collaborators and we've talked about, you know, collaborating with Winton and and stuff like that, and going over and doing the thing at, at Jazz at Lincoln Center, right? You did uh, a thing over there with with them. Was he was he uh, heading up? Uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center at that point? Um, you mean when I did it, that essentially Ellington album with him? Because I did I, the first, that's me singing on that first essentially Ellington. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, I did, I did that and I performed with David Murray's big band. Um, mm -hmm. And I performed with the Lincoln Center, you know, Jazz Orchestra. Um, but yeah, that was that was one collaboration. Woo. Well, some other people on here. I mean, just going down like Shelley Berg. I mean, I know you you collaborate with him and 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 John Clayton. I mean, oh. like one of one of the best arrangers and jazz bass players out there. Nancy mm -hmm. Wilson, Lena Horne, Doc Severance, and Tony Bennett, James Brown, Willie Nelson, Tierney Sutton, Frank Sinatra, Kurt Allen. Whoa. Like so, let let me just ask a couple of those. So Nancy Wilson, what was your what was your interaction like with Nancy Wilson? It was wonderful. Um, she was touring with the Basie Band when I was their regular singer, uh -huh. and so I got to spend a lot of time with her, and uh, we became friends. You know, yeah, just uh, close friends. And um, I've got uh, something brewing in yeah. tribute to her right now, actually. Oh, cool. Very can't really, I can't really speak on it yet, um, but it's it's pretty wonderful. I think it's going to be really, really great. I'm I'm so excited to hear it. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> another couple of people is is uh, so Tony Bennett and and Frank Sinatra. What was your uh, what was that connection there? What what were you doing with them? Um, we also worked when I was the vocalist with the Basie Band. We worked with Tony Bennett quite a bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, Frank Sinatra um, worked with the Basie Band when we did the reopening of the Chicago Theater. Oh, cool. And so um, before, that was two nights we did with Frank. And the first night I knocked on his door because I just wanted to say hello, you know, before I went out on stage. And, and so when I walked, when I knocked on the door, um, Edie Gourmet opened the door. Mm. And Steve Lawrence was in there too, you know. Yeah. And so, awesome singers, both of them. She she was a, an incredible vocalist too, by the way. For your listeners, they need to check her out. Edie Gourmet sure. was it, honey. Beautiful <laughs> phrasing, beautiful, 
beautiful timbre in her voice and had big pipes. You'll hear. Sure, sure. Um, so anyway, I went in and I said, I just wanted to say hello to Mr. Sinatra. And he said, they said, oh, come on in. And, and so he said, come on in, honey. Uh -huh. And so I said, hi. And they said, Frank, we're going to step out. So Stephen Eady stepped out. Uh -huh. And I said, I just wanted to, to say hello and, and meet you. He said, well, how's it going with the band? I said, well, my name is Carmen Bradford. He said, I know what your name is. Whoa. And, uh, he said, how's it going with the band? I said, it's going well. You know, I miss, of course, Mr. Basie. He said, yeah, he was really, really great. And I loved him and we loved each other. You know, how, how long, said, how long had it been uh, since uh, Mr. Basie had passed? Oh, let me think of who the leader was. It was Frank Foster. So he had been gone a while okay. because Thad Jones was the leader after Basie passed away. But uh, he said, well, have you eaten? Did you, would you like to have some dinner with me? And you know what, Christian? Normally I would have said, oh, no. You know, when I was younger, I would have said, yeah. no, no. You know, I don't want to disturb you. But he asked me. So I said, yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> so I sat down and uh, we had some chicken noodle soup together. Mm. And uh, I had a whole bowl and we talked. And he asked me, you know, what tunes I was doing. and who my arrangers were at that time and just had a, a lovely, lovely chat before my, and that was about maybe 35 minutes. My God, wow. Of me, with, me, with me and Frank, it was just wonderful. I mean, it, being right there, I mean, just having an intimate conversation with somebody who changed the the game of of jazz vocals i mean just one of one of the titans that we all revere uh you know how what what was that like i mean because i feel like if i was if i was in that situation i wouldn't even be able to like process necessarily what was coming out of his mouth you know i'd just be like i'm here and like i'm gonna try to digest you know whatever you know is going on but you know did you feel incredibly starstruck or did was did he just create an environment that was so easy to talk to or well you know what i learned my lesson at an early age you cannot waste your energy and opportunity on being so caught up in who you're talking to sure yeah it wastes too much time and you need to get over it quickly you yeah. know and and regroup Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to say a lot. I didn't ask him a lot of questions because he was asking me mm. since he, he knew, you know, he'd worked with the Basie band a, a gazillion times. So it was just two Basie vocalists talking about the gig. <laughs> How about that? Whoa! What, a, what a family to be a part of there. I okay. mean, Isn't that something though? Oh my God. Wow. So, so it, it was just, uh, he said, well, how many, how many weeks are, are you guys still traveling? You know, like when Mr. Basie was alive on the road, are you still doing, um, you know, I said, we're still doing 45 to 50 weeks and yeah. I've still brutal, you know? Um, and he said, well, how, how are you taking care of your voice? Just lots of, you know, singer questions. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really, really wonderful. And I've talked about my mom to him, you know? Yeah. because she auditioned for him and he wanted her to tour with him but she felt that we were too young to leave so she didn't accept the, the tour with frank wow i know right wow. but uh that that, um, that is that is though a testament to the devotion of the kind of mother that she must have been or, yeah. or, or still is i right. mean to, to turn down a a spot with Frank Sinatra to go on tour, um, take yeah. care of babies, which obviously is, is, uh, you know, so, I mean, some musicians might be like, I don't know if it was the right choice, but I mean, I think <laughs> unequivocally, most people would say, no, it's the right choice. Be there for your children. But, but still what, what a hard decision. I, I, yeah. I have to Really hard. She, yeah. her, she's got some stories that will knock you out. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to let her tell them because you're going to say, really? Yeah. Not really? Well, but, I'm, I'm so excited you know, there. You know, she um, she was Louis Armstrong's vocalist, too. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. 
Did you see that picture of me with sitting on Pops's lap? I have not seen that picture, but I would love to see that. that oh, I'll send it to you. Please do. Yeah. Oh, God, what, he what? was his vocalist in 1960? It was either 64 or 65. Uh huh. Um, and my dad took us to the gig, uh, took me and my brothers to the gig, and I can still remember him picking me up and putting me on his lap, you know, to take this photograph and that his hands were real meaty right in here, uh -huh. just kind of fat and stuck out, you know, <laughs> but they were really soft and uh, he just kind of handled me like I was a little doll, oh. which I probably was with my Easter dress on, you know, sure, sure. patent leather and things, you know, <laughs> but uh, I'm, sure, I'm so sorry. I thought you would have seen that. Oh, well, well, maybe that's just neglect on my part, you know, oh, no. going down the rabbit hole, but, but. Well, you know, it's in, it's on my website too, but it's so far into my photographs. I need to really just kind of put it up yeah. there, but it's in the museum as well, wow. in the Louis Armstrong Museum. Wow. Yeah, that... but, but uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, there were a lot of opportunities that she felt like she couldn't miss and some that she just had to make a decision about. Yeah. You know, yeah, but uh, yeah, it was something, uh, you know, spending that time with Ella, meeting Ella, you know, all those days mm -hmm. in, at Neiman's. But it's another thing when you're when you're a kid, when you're little and you're already my mother was very serious about creative visualization about with what you wanted to do in your life. You know, their attitude was always my mom and dad. You can do and have whatever you want, but you have to do the work. Yeah. You have to work hard to get it. And I had no problem with practice. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I wanted to achieve something vocally and I was just in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was always, always determined. And uh, I have friends that bring it up <laughs> sometimes online. If, if I post a young picture of myself, they'll say, well, this is, the, this is when she was putting her ear up to the stereo, trying to get every run and riff that Stevie Wonder was singing or, or, um, or Shaka Khan, you know? Yeah. They said, this is when she was going through this phase. It's interesting how your peers will remember things like that. But uh, yeah, yeah well, so we work with Joe Williams a lot, you know? Oh yeah. I really learned a lot from Joe too and, and stole a lot from him as well. Man. He was really amazing. You know, one one person uh, that I, I definitely want to ask about, and uh, it, and another person who I'm not sure if you had much interaction with him, but I, but I wanted to ask about in general. The two people are are John Hendricks, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and then Kurt also. Uh, so with with John, what did you ever get to to meet or interact with or perform with? Oh, John? Yeah. Um, I didn't perform with John, but we did a lot of the same festivals in Europe, you know? Yeah. When I say that, I mean the Basie Band, you know, and I, a lot of the same, you know, like the Montreux Festival and Nice, you know, because it was all the same tour, you know, you'd hit these different cities and countries. Um, but I knew him, you know, he was a lovely, lovely man, and um, it was great to to have the opportunity to just be in his presence, you know? Yeah, yeah. He was such a sweetheart and, and always very complimentary of my performance and just very loving and um, his wife as well, mm. you know? He's just the, the captain, you know? Uh, absolutely, the, the, absolutely. The absolutely. Uh, now my, my experience with Kurt, um, we did a finale number together when we did this tribute to Frank Sinatra at the Hollywood Bowl. Okay. With the Basie Band. And so it was wonderful to be, you know, uh, sharing the stage with him in that way. So it, I, I just loved it. I can't remember what we were singing either, but, mm. but I was standing next to him and, and on my left was, um, oh my goodness. I can't remember his name, but I'll tell you later. Uh, was it tenor player? No, no, it was a singer. Oh, okay. Um, Kurt was on my right, and uh, he sings now, but he's he's uh, has a uh, a car not a cartoon, but a. Uh, what oh, is it Seth, is. Seth MacFarlane? 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard him sing? Oh my God, he's he's great. It, you know, and and those those I don't know if you you watch any of the the stuff that he does. Uh, obviously, whenever I was younger and wanted to defy my parents' orders, I would watch the the risque cartoon on on television. You know, Family Guy. But you know, they would do. He does those. I mean, I, I think he records every episode with an eighty five piece orchestra. You know, and and. Um, he does those, uh, you know, tributes to the road to whatever, road to Rio, road to, you know, um, uh, those those old films. And so, you know, he does a lot of like singing musical numbers in most episodes, but even yeah. specifically on those road to tributes. Uh -huh. And so then once I heard him, you know, like his his jazz records, I was like, man, he, he's got it, man. And uh, yeah. Yeah. It's really wonderful. And that particular performance, um, he was standing next to me and and he sang, um, I can't remember which tunes he did of Frank's on that Frank Sinatra tribute, mm. but my God, his chops are just wicked. Yeah. And I'll never forget him saying to me, he said, it's just an honor to be on stage with all of you. And I turned and I said, what are you talking about? You <laughs> Badass. <laughs> my language, but you are so badass, honey. You deserve to be up here. Yeah, yeah. You know? I said you are just off the. Uh, uh, I'm drooling, and yeah. I, that was the first time I had heard him sing. You know, yeah. This was several years ago, but um. Well, it's that. It's like maybe that, about six years ago. But wow. Like that thing we were talking about about just the imposter syndrome. I mean, you know, like you're just like marveling at the people who are around you. Right. And, yeah, and I think that's why I I specifically have a um, a certain love or or um, affection for the voices of of people like you and like Kurt and like Seth and like those people who just you are so able to do the smallest, most intimate, most you know like come in close because I'm going to tell you a secret, and then can just like to borrow what you said about Ella Fitzgerald at Carnegie Hall, you can rip the plaster off the walls because there is that unlocking of, you know, that, that large sound that I just gravitate towards. And it just, and it, it, it has elements of like a very bel canto kind of sound, but it's marrying both the power and the passion of what these tunes are capable of with the style of the instrumentalists and, mm -hmm. and and I think that's what I think that's what what jazz vocalists should be aiming towards all the time I mean you think about like the Johnny Hartman uh John Coltrane record Coltrane was trying to sound like Hartman Hartman's trying to sound like Coltrane like in these in these ways or just instrumentalists and vocalists in general we should be admiring how each other compliments and trying to emulate that in our sound in a way that, you know, and this is just my personal philosophy in a way that, that makes it to where we are so deeply invested in, you know, singers should be invested in the changes, especially whenever it comes to like alternate lines, you know, mm -hmm. and, and placing your own mark on things. And, and like you said, instrumentalists should be focused on the lyrics so that way you can have a dialogue you know their dialogue is the changes our dialogue is the lyrics and they go together so like we got to do our due diligence there and you you just so perfectly do that and it's just thank you that's thing. so kind of you thank you very much of course um i i, I want to be respectful of your time we've been going for about an hour and a half and i i don't want to take up your full afternoon i know time flies right i'm having a blast <laughs> i i do have a couple more questions for you if that's okay for me to ask sure okay so um uh i i'd written just a couple things just to to go or it's like the homecoming with queenie pie doing that at, at butler <laughs> i mean i mean that uh, you kind of gave me some wide eyes there. What was what was that regarding? Uh, that I'm not an actress. I would love to be. Uh huh. Uh, I, I I loved that experience, but I'm sure they they probably would have loved to have gotten someone else after my performance. But 
The music oh. was wonderful. Was I, I would I would never say that. I don't think anybody would ever say that. But uh, but <laughs> but <laughs> say it. But <laughs> sure, sure. But, well, but the music was really, really wonderful. Sometimes. The arrangements and that that was missing from the arrangements because there were it was a lot of music that wasn't finished. And mm. John Mills and Jeff Helmer uh, yeah. wrote the rest. Oh wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes indeed. It was it was it was a great experience, but man, I was just terrified. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, and but to have music written uh, by or to finish writing of, of John Mills, I mean, John Mills still is just one of the most revered people in town, you know, uh, uh, him and, and, and uh, Paul Baker. Uh, mm. Yeah, I don't know if Paul was... was well, he was finishing up Duke Ellington's music, though. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> un, un, unbelievable. I mean, like, the... Hey. You know, John Mills okay. plays in town, and it's just unbelievable to hear his writing. Just yeah, he's really, really special. He's, he's really, really special to me. He's my brother from another mother. Yeah. <laughs> well, a another question that I had was about um, uh, about scatting, and uh, and and so your your father being a trumpet player. You know, I I my main instrument. Well, it was it was kind of a uh, duel between voice and trumpet uh, growing up, and uh, I was more focused on trumpet at the end of, of high school. But and and the way that I kind of got my start necessarily is is Brian Casey, really great educator down in in Lake Jackson. Had uh, I was playing uh, I was playing lead in the big band my first year uh, in the lower band, and then my second or my senior year I I uh, was playing second next to my best friend who has since been on my records and a uh, really, really amazing trumpet player out in California named uh, Nathaniel McKay. But anyways, um, he was like, hey, do you want to do a vocal tune? You know, step down, put your trumpet up for one and then come down and do a vocal tune. I was like, sure, mm -hmm. yeah, let's do it. So I did it, someone recorded it uh, that I didn't know that they did. And then a couple, or I mean, I guess a month and a half later, um, uh, the Houston Symphony was having uh, uh, pianist and vocalist Tony Desaire from New York come down and uh, perform uh, with the Houston Symphony. And mm -hmm. he posted this video and was like, I need an opening act, submit your videos or whatever. And so I submitted it. I was working at a as a busboy at El Chico, this uh, uh, Mexican food restaurant in the mall. Oh, my El Chico. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It, even now, it's my comfort food. But uh, it was it was in the mall, and uh, yeah. So uh, I remember I, we were supposed to hear on December thirty first, and I was working December thirty first. I was working New Year's Eve the very next day, and mm -hmm. or, or I was working December thirtieth. I'm, I'm sorry, and then I was working on on the thirty first as well, and okay. I didn't hear anything on the thirtieth. And I was glued to my phone. I mean, I would like bust the table. I'd go back in the back storage closet and just refresh my email. And and then, um, anyways, uh, the next day, I'm I'm so sad and still holding out a little bit of hope that maybe I'll get an email. And I get an email in the middle of my shift, probably 9 p.m. And they were like, uh, "Sorry for the delay, but we've chosen you to open for Tony for three nights." And wow. And so. so then that was my first experience. So I remember I quit like three days later. It wasn't even a paid gig, but I quit my job. And I was like, this is it, I'm gonna make it. And, and, and I should not have done that probably because then I started doing just like $20 gigs around town, you know, afterwards. But that first Houston gig was, I mean, it was that, it was that intoxicating feeling of this mm -hmm. is it, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, so, um, all that to say, I, I shifted more towards the vocal side as opposed to the trumpet. And I still played on a, on a few gigs, just play over some, some Clifford Brown tunes and things like that. But um, whenever I'm scatting and whenever I'm improvising, because I have that connection to the trumpet, I'm mostly channeling, instead of tenor players, I'm mostly channeling people like Lee Morgan and Clifford Brown and Freddie Hubbard and 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 pianists like like Bill Evans and such, but 
uh, with your father being a, a, a trumpet player, do you find that there is a specific instrument that you uh, feel like you are channeling most the vocabulary style, or is it just kind of a mix of, of any type of instrument that, that you visualize when you're scatting? I'm not thinking of any instrument when I'm scatting. Interesting. Okay. I am thinking, um, I'm thinking about, well, first of all, I started scatting very late. Mm -hmm. And when I say late, I mean, maybe, um, I'll just say not too long ago. Okay. <laughs> Because I can't remember exactly what year that would have been, but um, but when I finally started, uh, first of all, I was pushed into scatting on stage, which I did not in enjoy doing, but I was in Germany doing a television broadcast with the WDR Big Band and the Super Bass, Super Bass Trio. Ray Brown, Christian McBride, and John Clayton. I was working with them. And when we did the finale, we started working on the finale. They said, well, we're just going to do a blues. And, and uh, they said, well, Carmen, you just scat a chorus. I said, oh, oh no, honey, I don't scat. <laughs> sure. And so Ray Brown said, Listen, uh, little girl, we didn't just bring you over here because you're pretty and you have on a pretty dress. Do you understand? Ooh. Now you get yourself together. You have to scout on this. I said, no, I, I can just wait in the back and y'all just. Yeah, just go. <laughs> at yeah, wait. you guys just bring me out for a bow at the end. Sure, sure, sure. sure. And they said, absolutely not. And you're going to start. Whoa. And then we're, we're going to take our solos after that. I was like, I can't do it, you know. Yeah. They said, oh, you'll have it together by tonight, you know, but we're just going to run it right now. And I was just, it was traumatizing. It really was. Boy. And unfortunately, it's on YouTube. <laughs> it's <laughs> terrible. Is, is it just the finale or, or the whole concert? I think it's just that too. Okay. Finale and there are different, uh, recordings of it because there's one that's shorter than the other but the long one is is on there as well and you know and i actually did it which i was shocked and i just yeah. always i couldn't hear the changes and then that same shift that happened to me when i started singing when i discovered jazz and discovered yeah. billy holiday in my dad's office it was that same kind of shift i just couldn't hear the changes it's almost like I had to still myself. Yeah. When I was singing on certain tunes, and then all of a sudden I could hear everything in the chord. Yeah. I could hear everything in the chord and I could sing it. And it was like, yeah. and I can't tell a vocal student how to hear that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think I think what I what I tried to do to really start to hear, because there's a, a you know, mentor slash colleague of mine in town that I play a lot with, who, uh, uh, his name is Matthew Maldonado, now a doctor. He just uh, officially got his doctorate from uh, UT uh, in the past like two days. But um, he kept telling me, you know, he, he was, he's been like hard on me, but not in a bad way and that he's been disrespectful in a way that just like, he's really pushed me over the years. He's like, nope, it's not enough. Keep going. It's not enough. Keep going. Oh, and as I, far as the scatting? Yeah. Well, just in music in general and like the, the t kinds of tunes and then vocalities oh. and, and all of these different things. And um, anyways, we, uh, I, I remember showing him the real the big catalyst point for me where I started to started to really feel like I was understanding the changes was I'd show him a bunch of stuff and he'd be like, yeah, those are all kind of like gestural licks, but they're all general things like you're singing like, you know, you're singing the the one, two, five, and sixes of the mm -hmm. chord. And he's not mm -hmm. like not focusing on the the thirds and the sevenths. And uh -huh. like 
sharp 11 stuff, you know, like, and, and, and he was like, never use, you know, diatonic four, never just hit, you know, the four, uh, just, he's like, you need to start to really hear the changes. So he gave me like, uh, an informal assignment where I took a standard and I took the changes mm -hmm. and instead of playing, you know, like walking bass lines on the piano of uh, typical, you know, just like, uh, things of like the ones and the vibes. He's like, I want you to play the changes, but instead of playing the entire chord, I want you to only play the thirds and the sevenths. And I want you to hear how different those chords sound if you yeah. only play the entire, you know, 32 bars of the thirds and sevenths. And that opened up my ears where I was like, oh, whoa, the, the, this is the world that I need to be living in. Things that, you know, make you turn your head and you're like, oh, whoa, like that, that's it, man. Yeah. So, so um, I, I can't remember how, how I got onto that per se, but uh, yeah, that's- that's, great. that's some great information. You know, I, one thing I was curious about whenever you said WDR, I was gonna ask you if you'd worked with them before, uh, was, uh, was Paul Shigihara uh, in the band at that time, the guitar player? You know what, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember, and you might, when if you look at the video, you might see him, but I, I don't remember. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Uh, there's a, uh, a guitar player in there that I, I really love named Paul Shigihara, and then also a, a trumpet player that I really like uh, named, uh, I, I wanna make sure I get it right, it's Roy, Roy Bru Bruyles, Bruyles, or something to that effect. I, I, I feel bad, my, my diction professors from college would just come in here and, and smack me if they heard me trying to, to pronounce that. But anyways, um, so I, I have to say, Carmen, this has just been one of my favorite after, maybe my favorite afternoon of quarantine um, so far. I just, yeah. It's just so much fun to, to talk to you and, and hear your stories and hear your wisdom. And, and I, I just can't tell you how much it, it means to me that you would take some time out of your day to, to just have a chat with me. And, and well, it's been a pleasure and you asked wonderful, wonderful questions. And the next time I'm in Austin, we got to do something. We got to sing something together. Oh my gosh. Wait, or, record, or record something. You just say the time and the place and I will show okay. up three oh. hours early and we'll do it. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll book us somewhere. Oh, I will. I will book us anywhere you want in town. And oh. with your name, it would not be hard to book any, any venue in town. So, well, I, I hope you mean that. Oh, I absolutely do. Uh, oh. you take it to the bank. Uh, oh. the, the way that we, we end the show uh, is two speed round questions. And the okay. first is if there is something, it doesn't have to be the definitive this is what you got to check out. It could just be what you're listening to this week or in the past year or just your all time favorite. If you had to tell the listeners, go check out X album or this person or this tune, what would you say uh, is the, the prescribed listening, so to speak? Um, Ella and Oscar. Mm. I think that's what the album's called. Mm. Um, that entire album is absolutely gorgeous. And I think it's important because he accompanies her in, in a way that I cannot describe to you. It's truly like they are one. Yeah. You know, I've only experienced that I think with, with Shelly Bird and a few other, um, accompanists, but it is truly a masterpiece. I'll yeah. say. Yeah. Um, uh, all of Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Especially okay. all the, all the early years, you know, I, I was going to say if, and I know this is a loaded question, my, my third guest on <laughs> the show, who is also one of my best friends who I worked with a lot whenever David was up in Colorado for that year. And now this person I'm about to say is over, uh, just started today. His, his, uh, masters in composition at, uh, Frost in Miami. I was named Thomas Wang Linsky. He is an amazing composer, piano player, arranger, and loves Stevie. So I'm sure this question, Thomas, this is for you. If you had to pick a Stevie Wonder record, which I know is a hard thing to do, which one are you going to say, like, this is it? 
I would choose music of my mind. Mm. I think that's the name of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great album, but I'm a serious Shaka Khan fan as well. Okay. What's if it? not more, more serious than, than Steve. So I am ashamed to say that I have not done as much of a Shaka Khan uh, deep dive. So for me, what's, what's the prescribed uh, Shaka Khan listening? Ooh. <laughs> all, of her, all of her albums with uh, Rufus and Shaka Khan, mm -hmm. those are all great albums. Okay. All of them. All of and them. Just her, just her early stuff, period, is, is pretty serious. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She'll take you to school for, for <laughs> reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will get on it. Um, the, the last question that, that we end with, um, and uh, you don't have to name names if you don't want to. You don't have to uh, think of like the uh, most explicit example of this, but um, we always ask, you know, we have no shortage of like crazy gigs from hell, so to speak, where it's just like, oh my God, I cannot believe that happened. Everything from a tornado coming through the gig and then having to play the wedding afterwards, even though everything's toppled over, people getting shot at and having to pull them over the bar. Um, some, one of my favorites is, is he's, his episode's gonna release in a couple of days, but he said that uh, he was playing this wedding and the band leader comes in late because he had three weddings that day. And he comes in and he's reading down the, the, uh, the guest list as he's introducing people and he gets to uh, father of the bride and he's like, please welcome in the father of the bride, deceased. And like in the middle of somebody's wedding, just like oh, things where everything yeah. just like falls flat. So if you could think of, uh, and again, you don't have to name names, but just like a crazy gig story where you're like, yeah, that, that happened and that one's one for the books. What, what would be it? It would be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my first performance with the Basie Band because it was three mm -hmm. weeks before my arrangements were written for me. Oh, wow. Eric Dixon wrote, um, uh, I think he wrote Our Love is Here to Stay, um, or either he wrote A Foggy Day, I can't remember, and Dennis Wilson, uh, trombonist Dennis Wilson was the other writer, but mm -hmm. I sang, the, the introductions were very, very similar. Uh -huh. So on my first performance with the Basie Band, I sang the other tune. Where I was supposed to be singing, you know, our love, our love is here to stay. I, I sang the, you know, the melody to a foggy day and the lyrics too, and I kept singing. And then when I finally realized that that uh, it was the other song, I looked, I turned and looked at Mr. Basie, you know, who was sitting across at the piano, and I looked at him like, what do I do, you know? He yes, went like this. <laughs> But it sounds like, I mean, obviously history has shown that he showed you just the utmost grace and, and. He was like, and I know we've reached the end of your show and I don't want to take up any more of your time, but please, please. he, he treated me like I was, um, like I was his little girl. Yeah. So can I, do you have time for just a oh, two no. minute? No, I'm, I'm just worried about going over your time. You can go all over my time, please. So the morning after. Uh, I joined the band. Uh, the first night they were working with Tony Bennett. That's how we started. Oof. And so uh, I have to back up and say to you that um, when he introduced me to the band after I had arrived in Boston, they arrived after I did. And he said, we'll get on last. And so when he introduced me, he said, gentlemen, this is our new little girl. And they're all seated on the bus, you know. And he said, What's your name, honey? <laughs> <laughs> I remember my name and I said, Carmen. And he said, this is our new little girl, Carmen. And oh. then just kind of looked at me like that. And, <laughs> and so, and then he went like this with his finger and pointed at everybody's face on the bus so he could make eye contact with them. Uh -huh. And he said, don't even think about it. To the guys in the band. So, <laughs> so said, now you just sit right here, baby, right here in front of me, okay? Like that. Oh. So the next morning after the Tony Bennett gig, 
um, I got a call from the gentleman that toured with Mr. Basie, that traveled with him and took care of his clothes and everything. And so he said, Mr. Basie would like for you to come down to his room in about 20 minutes. I said, oh, okay. I didn't think anything of it, you know? And so when I was leaving my room, the phone rang again, it was my dad. Uh -huh. And he said, I said, he said, well, how did it go last night? I said, well, you, we worked with Tony Bennett last night. I said, they worked with Tony Bennett last night. And it was just great. And Tony was so wonderful. And he said, wow, Carmen, isn't that something? I said, yeah. He said, well, how are the guys in the band? I said, well, they're so old. <laughs> You have to remember, I was 23. Sure. Just a tiny bit older than what you are now, but I had been, you know, getting my groove on singing Doobie Brothers and Shaka Contents prior to that. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Austin tearing it up, right? So <clears throat> he said, my dad said, uh, well, what are you going to do today? I said, well, today is our day off, and Mr. Basie wants me to come to his room right now. So I have to go. And my father said, what the hell for? <laughs> sure. I said, I don't know. I'm just, you know, he wants me to come to his room. So he said, let me tell you something. If he tries to touch you, you just knock him out. Mm. You just knock him out, Carmen. You just run. Oof. I said, dad. <clears throat> he said, did you hear what I said? I mean it. I said, I haven't even started to sing yet. I'm not going to beat yeah. up Kevin Basie yet. <laughs> I sing? What are you talking about? Yeah. You, you said, said he was in a, you said he he was said in a motorized he, cart, too, so it wouldn't even be a fair fight. He said, did you hear what I said? I want you to run. If he tries to touch you, you just knock him, knock him out and, and get out of that room. Yeah. And said, okay, he said, you call me as soon as you finish. I said, okay. He said, I mean it. I said, okay. Yeah. So I went to Mr. Basie's room, and the gentleman let me in, and um, he said, come on in, honey. Go on in the bedroom. Mr. Basie's in there. I said, oh boy, here we go. Mm -hmm. So I walked in and there was a, a table set up because he was having breakfast and he had on the most beautiful blue, royal blue satin uh, robe with matching pajamas and monogram on air, velvet house slippers and oh, jet. God. Looking like old money, right? <laughs> so beautiful white linen tablecloth, silver, 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 beautiful china, you know. Yeah. At the hotel. So he said, have a seat, honey. Did you have breakfast? And I said, no, I, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. No, thank you. So uh, he said, well, what did you think of the show? I said, I think it's the greatest thing I, I've ever seen. And I can't wait to sing with the band. Mm. He said, oh, that's wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. And he said, well, what are you going to do today? This is our day off. I said, oh, I don't, I was just going to go and get some souvenirs from my friends and and he said, oh, that's nice. He said, now, you know, tomorrow we work with, with Sarah Vaughn. Do you know who that is? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, we're going to work with Sarah Vaughn, and, and uh, I'll introduce you to her. Don't approach her, okay? Because she doesn't like little girls like that. Interesting. And I said, okay, all right. So he said, well, come over here and sit next to me. I said, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to beat up Count Basie. Here we go. I'm getting ready to beat up Count Basie and miss my opportunity to become one of the vocalists. Oh, oh, that's your <laughs> so I went and sat on the bed next to him. And he said, no, no, sit closer, honey. So he was patting the bed like this for mm. me to sit closer. <clears throat> he said, a little closer. Then I was right next to him. Mm. Then he grabbed my hand, Christian and pulls it into his lap. And then he leans on me, because I'm on his right. He leans on me and reaches into his robe pocket and pulls something out and puts it in my hand and then closes my hand up like that. And then he said, now go shopping and come back and tell me what you bought. Show me what you bought, okay? Like that. Oh my Lord. And I said, okay. <laughs> You were like, I could get used to this. So I, I opened up my hand and it was a hundred dollar bill. And so I went out and bought a bunch of crap and I'm leaving out a lot of the story because um, my ticket wasn't at the airport when, when I got there. So all of my friends went and bought me a ticket to Boston, by the way, all of my 
my classmates from Houston Tillerson because mm -hmm. they didn't want me to miss the opportunity. But so anyway, I was getting gifts for them. So I bought a bunch of crap, snow, snow globes with Boston in it and baseballs sure. and, you know, foam fingers and stuff like that. Yeah. So I came back to his room after that. And uh, I went on in and he said, well, show me what you got. So I pulled out each thing and he just <laughs> looked so happy watching me do that, you know. And so after I took everything out, he said, well, do you have any change for me? I said, oh, was I supposed to bring you some change? He said, no, honey, I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> and said, uh, he said, well, let's do this on our day off, okay? We don't have to tell anybody what we're doing. He said, but you just come to my room and I'll give you some money and you just go shopping, okay? And I said, okay. <laughs> well, you know, it turns out that um, Mr. Basie has a daughter that's still alive. Mm. And she's in her late 70s now, early 80s. Her name is Diane. And she's mentally challenged. Um, they said she would never walk, that she would never speak, you know. Um, but she did learn to walk. She's not able to communicate, you know, in a way for, you know, I guess anybody that doesn't know her well to know what that is that she's communicating. But I think I was kind of feeling a void in his life. And wow. he had the opportunity to uh, spoil a little girl. Yeah. And Oh, that's what he did. He spoiled me rotten for the the year that I got to work with him. I just absolutely adored him, and he did me as well. It was a really lovely relationship, and uh, I just had to share that little story with you. Oh, well, it's it's such a it's such a testament, um, and I'm so glad that you did because when you were telling it, I was like. I remember hearing this story at, at the concert. You had, you had told the story at the concert, but I had forgotten. I knew there was one story I had forgotten. So I'm so glad that you told me, but it just is a testament to just the, the elegance and grace, not only that he played with and not only the way that he carried himself, but just how he treated those he cared about. And, and I mean, to take when, when you're on top of the world, I mean, you know, we, we have two big endings that we end tunes with and we call them the Basie ending and the Ellington ending. I mean, like, <laughs> he's, he's one of the people who we will remember forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. And for him to show you that, that amount of like attention and importance and grace and that you are worthy to be on stage with those people when he could be the meanest person in the world, nobody could say a thing because he was just the best. It's yeah. just a testament, I think, not only to the culture of of our industry of how we should be, you know, welcoming in younger musicians to the fold, but just to to his his personality in general. I and mean, it's just the most beautiful story. So I, I'm yeah. so it makes me so happy to hear it. Thank you so much, Christian. This has been wonderful. Uh, well, the the moment that we can get together and that you come to town, we'll we'll plan a session, we'll plan a gig, we'll plan the whole bit, dinner, drinks, and we'll we'll have a grand old time. But Carmen, this has been so soul enriching. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Thank you for having me. It's just wonderful. I can't wait to hear you sing. Uh, well, I'll, I'll send you, if you care to hear any of it, I'll send you some records and, and, and I that love would that. so I awesome. love Carmen, take care of yourself. Uh, be safe right. and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks again. Uh, of course. Bye-bye. my dreams, your face will flower through the darkness of the night. Like the light of home you call me, or an angel watching on me. This will be my shining hour, till I'm with you again.
not preserved.